I've started a series on how to turn your weaknesses into strengths. And uh, last week we looked at, um, and some of this will be uncomfortable for many of us, I can tell you. But last week we looked at how uh, the weakness of insecurity can affect us right through our lives. You know, insecurity was planted by the past, it's watered by the present, but it can affect us long into the future. And if, you've, if you're struggling with insecurities, then it's going to hamper you as you, as you live and you grow. But I want to touch on today a, a more subtle but equally as destructive weakness that we all have and we rarely discuss. That is the weakness of comparisons. Now, <clears throat> when you think about it, comparisons, are, they're normal. You know, if, if you go to a, a, a supermarket and you look at brands of cereal, you're going to compare between them, aren't you? I mean, if you're like me, you're comparing based on the colour of the box and, and how yummy the picture on the front looks. If you're like Fiona, you'll pull it apart and look at all these chemicals that are or aren't in it. I think that's a male-female difference right there. If it tastes good, I'm in. But no, she'll pull it apart and have a good look at it. So comparisons in themselves aren't bad. You know, we compare cars, we compare products, we compare you know, all sorts of things. So I'm not saying all comparisons are bad, but there is a, a time at which when we apply comparisons to people and to ourselves that this can become a very destructive mix in our life. You know, we, we look at someone else and we say, well, compared to you, I'm okay. You know, um, if you open your Bible, please, to Galatians chapter 6. And uh, let's look at verse 3, because Paul hits this direct, he hits this head on. Because this is a problem of mankind since day dot. It is not a recent phenomenon, although it may be enhanced by many of our, our modern uh, mod cons. But uh, it's been there for, forever. Galatians chapter 6 verse 3 says this, <coughs> Paul writing, If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbour. For each one will have to bear his own load. So in that passage, Paul is speaking against comparisons with others. He's saying, don't compare yourself with someone else all the time. Test your own work. And really, our standard should be God's standard for us, not our standard for someone else or someone else's standard for us. He's saying, then you can boast in your own whatever you do or not instead of comparing yourself to someone else. So comparisons are sometimes constructive, but they, they are very often destructive. They give rise to envy, and envy is the daughter of pride and the mother of many kinds of evil. So think about it. Just take a few moments and think about you comparing yourself to someone else. Okay, if you compare yourself to someone worse than you, you feed your pride. If you compare yourself to someone better than you, you feed your insecurities and you get discouraged. Comparing ourselves to others is a lose-lose. Doesn't matter what we do, we're going to lose if we start comparing ourselves to others. Now the problem is the comparison leads to envy. Don't say you don't feel it. Because, you know, we are all envious of something. Envy is described in the dictionary as, as being, and I quote, a feeling of discontent or covetedness with regards to another's advantages, successes, possessions, etc. So Harold Coffin said this, envy is the art of counting your neighbor's blessings instead of your own. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Count your neighbor's blessings, name them one by one. It doesn't really work, does it? Socrates, the great Greek philosopher, said this. Now this guy is not a Christian, but listen to what he says. Envy is the daughter of pride, the author of murder and revenge, the begetter of secret sedition, the perpetual tormentor of virtue. Envy is the filthy slime of the soul. I like that. The filthy slime of the soul. Venom, a poison, a quicksilver that consumeth the flesh and drieth the bones. Now in the Bible, envy is all the way through all of the stories in the Bible. Have you noticed that? Look at what Jacob's children did to Joseph in Genesis 37 when they figured out that Joseph was the favoured child. They didn't say, well, how can I lift my game to be more favoured? They got envious and it led to this incredible, you know, where they threw him in a pit and all that sort of stuff. See, comparisons and envy drove Saul to attempt murder, drove David to adultery and drove the Pharisees to prideful arrogance. So let's make it clear. The origin of comparisons and hence envy is not God, it is the devil. In fact, in Galatians 5 verse 19, it says this, 
the envy is listed as one of the fruits of the flesh not a fruit of the spirit so it says this Galatians 5 19 James says this oh sorry it says that in, in Galatians 5 19 but James says this in James chapter 3 verse 14 to 16 listen to this but you have bitter jealousy or envy and selfish ambition in your hearts do not boast and, and be false to the truth the, <coughs> James says this it is not the wisdom that comes down from above it is earthly it is unspiritual it is demonic for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist there will be disorder and every vile practice do you think he's overstated it I don't you look at where jealousy and envy and comparison exist in large you have Dis, uh, disorder and every vile practice you see comparison gives rise to envy and envy itself is dark and diabolical and it is never good and I'm telling you this it is never God so what causes us to compare ourselves to others and hence to, to let envy into our life and despise others so I want to run through some of the causes of comparison leading to envy number one is insecurities now we looked at this last week the incredible destructive power of insecurities and these same insecurities cause us to feel threatened or envious of someone else's success does that affect you if you're honest you would say yes even the best of us it still affects us I mean have a think about it you know do you struggle with this I reckon you do let's have a look at, at an instance in the Bible where where comparisons gave direct rise to evil in 1 Samuel chapter 18 so if you've got a Bible check this out it's really interesting this is what Saul had David in he'd, he'd beaten Goliath he'd won David had won a bunch of battles and Saul was the king he was in the position of authority he was the top guy in the land but then the women verse 7 the women sang to one another as they celebrated and they sang this Saul has struck down his thousands but David his tens of thousands so Saul didn't say oh I've struck down thousands what did he concentrate on the tens of thousands that David had struck down then it says this and Saul was very angry and this saying displeased him and he said they have ascribed to David tens of thousands and to me only thousands what more can he have but the kingdom and Saul eyed David from that day on so what happened was he, he was there was a comparison was made he didn't necessarily make it initially but when people started singing this song he went oh man he's better than me and this led to him directly trying to murder David. You see, envy is a poison that every one of us must fight and it is fueled by our insecurities. So how do you feel when someone else gains the success that you want? How do you feel, if you're at work, guys, how do you feel when the other guy gets a raise? How do you feel, ladies, when your child is compared to others and theirs seems to be a little angel and yours is a little monster? Has that ever happened? No. No. How do you feel when someone else gets an award that you don't? Can you genuinely feel happy for them without comparison or without envy? You know, as a, as a young um, guy in ministry, I used to have bands and we used to go and like Christian uh, festivals used to run these Battle of the Bands and after about one, I stopped. And you know why I stopped? Not because we were good or not good or anything like that. I stopped because backstage, I'm telling you, it was just a... A, a, a hotbed of, of envy and evil I could not believe it they go out on stage and they sing praise the Lord hallelujah backstage they were daggers at each other why because of because of comparisons and a competition like that drives comparison and so people you know get overwhelmed with envy recently I was um, as you probably know was part of the father of the year awards we had five finalists we, we met each other we had a bit of a chat we're sitting on stage together and I, I actually took out that award but I remember thinking I am not the best father here there's at least two guys who were far better fathers than I will ever be turns out I took out that competition but I tell you it was even when I won I was still comparing myself adversely can you believe that like this is how our minds operate and uh, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 17 18 says this Paul writes again let let the one who boasts boast in the Lord for it is not the one who commends himself who is approved but the one whom the Lord commends and I think that's a great key there when we are insecure we compare ourselves with others all the time we need to compare ourselves to God's standard 
and then we will never measure up, but his strength can help us to attain more. The second cause is greed and coveting. Now, when you compare yourself to others, you inevitably find someone who has something you want or desire. Is this true? You're, look, you're sounding very quiet this morning. You're not getting convicted out there, are you? Because I am. I tell you, as a pastor, I go to a conference at another church. I go to the toilet and I get toilet envy. Because I'm standing, I'm standing in the toilet. It's got nice tiles. It's got, uh, obviously it's the men's toilet. It's got nice urinals. And, and, and we have all of us and 200 year old holes in the ground out there for us. I get toilet envy. I get car park envy. I go into the car parks and they're nice and big and they're tarred. And I've got Max playing Tetris out here with cars trying to fit us in you know there is so much you know we have so much yet we're so envious of other people my friend Bill Newman says this he paraphrases Exodus 20 and he says this thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's crystal cathedral and I, I like that have you been to the crystal cathedral in, in Anaheim in, in uh, Los Angeles it would make a great church for us I'm telling you now but I must not covet that. Coveting is just, and look, it, it affects all of us. I have a nice house, but it's not a luxury house on a canal. I have a nice car, but it's not a Tesla. I have some nice computers, but there's always a better computer out there. As soon as you buy your computer, they've invented a better computer. It's ridiculous. It just goes on and on and on. See, comparisons of material things are never helpful. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 21. <coughs> you will know the Ten Commandments. Do we know the Ten Commandments? Have a look at Deuteronomy 5 21. You shall not cover your neighbor, covet your neighbor's wife. And you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything else that is your neighbor's. See, comparisons between you and someone else lead to greed, they lead to envy, and it breaks one of the Ten Commandments. It really does. And it doesn't matter if you're the richest guy in town, there is still someone out there to covet. It doesn't matter if you have the most beautiful wife, which I do, there's still someone else's wife out there to covet if you, go, if you decide to go down that road. Now, the richest man in modern history, have you any idea who it was? The richest man in the last hundred years. It's not Bill Gates, it's not Richard Branson, it was an oil tycoon called J.D. Rockefeller. He was in the billions, and this is back in the early 1900s, and he was interviewed by a reporter one day and said, Mr. Rockefeller, how much money is enough? And he replied, just a little bit more. The richest man in the world. You see, it's comparisons. Now, an often misquoted scripture is 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. Do you know 1 Timothy 6 verse 10? Look it up, it's an incredible verse. It says this, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs, or many arrows, if you like. The love of money, it says, is the root of all evil. Money isn't evil. Don't believe money is evil. If you've got evil money, trust me, give it to our church. We'll show you how holy we can make it. <laughs> but money is not evil. Okay, money is, is neutral. It's neither good nor bad. The love of money, it says, is the root of all kinds of evil. And it really is. Why? Because of greed and comparison and envy. That's why. Listen, if you don't compare yourself with others or, or with what you have or what you do have not or what they have and what they have not, you go a long way to overcoming greed. You really do. The third cause is ego and pride. <clears throat> now, pride is the basis of all sin because pride makes you disobedient to God. And trust me, pride is alive and well in our world. Is that true? And in our church, all churches, pride is alive and well. Now, I used to go to, um, when I was a little bit younger and sillier, I used to go to quite a few optometry conferences and I actually stopped going to certain conferences because when we got together, we should be talking about how we treat certain patients and we were talking about cars and houses and the size of our practices. And I thought, I don't need to go and listen to this stuff. I don't really care. So I stopped going to certain conferences. Pastors' conferences are just as bad at times. We compare the size of our church, our facilities, our successes. And, and the difference when you get pastors together is we, we couch it in a sort of a, a, a pseudo-humble vocabulary. You know, we, we sort of use humble words to tell them how great we are. 
In fact, I was once given a badge for humility, but they took it off me because I wore it. Think about it. <laughs> if insecurities and coveting involve you comparing yourself by looking up to others, then it feeds your ego and pride. If it, if, uh, sorry, it, it feeds your covetedness. If, if, if it's comparing down, looking down to others, it feeds your ego and pride. Jesus shared this parable in Luke 18. And this really sums up the pride thing about comparisons. Listen, he hits this head on. Listen to this. Two men went up to the temple one, uh, to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now the Pharisee, standing by himself, this is Luke 18, 10 and on, prayed this. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector was the opposite. He stood a long way off. He would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, says Jesus, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You can't say it better than that story. And many of us are guilty of a religious pride because we compare ourselves with others. When we see someone less fortunate, less successful, we should be moved with love and compassion for them and endeavour to help them, not feel superior. Sometimes we even try and help them by feeling superior. And it, does, it really doesn't work. Comparison can cause pride. And Jesus is scathing in his judgment. He hates pride. Jesus especially hates religious pride. And I think there's a huge warning for us, don't you? Right there. Ecclesiastes 4.4 says this, Then I saw that all toil and all skill in work came from a, a man's envy of his neighbour. This also is vanity, a striving after the wind. Solomon said envy and comparisons are vanity, and he is right. The fourth thing is frustration. Now Psalm 73 verse 3 says this, For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And it's frustrating to see someone else prosper when you don't, especially if they're wicked and you're trying, you're still there waiting humbly for God to come through for us and some wicked guy goes out and hits the jackpot. Comparisons. We all lost, you know, many of us lost money in the GFC. Fiona and I lost a stack of money in the, in the GFC. But we kept trying to serve and honour the Lord. And it really was irritating when out and out crooks seemed to be making money when we were sort of being faithful and we weren't making anything. We were going out backwards. Habakkuk experienced exa exactly this, the frustrated prophet. He starts his book of the Bible frustrated at how long it takes God to prosper his people. He says this in Habakkuk 1.13. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You hear his frustration? Have you ever gone before the Lord and said, it's not fair? Only one person in the whole church has ever said to God, it's not fair. I've said it. Here's the thing. Life's not fair. And, you know, I share Habakkuk's frustration sometimes. But what fuels that is comparison. You know, it is, not, it is a lot easier to go through hardship yourself waiting for the Lord. But when you compare yourself to a wicked guy who seems to be doing all right, you get frustrated and that can drive, the comparison is what drives that. The fifth thing is a very touchy one, self-victimisation. See, in modern Australia, victimisation is rampant. Comparison leads many people to think that they are constantly the victims. Am I right? I think this is a particular problem for our nation, perhaps more than others. You see, we think we are victims of our past, victims of our circumstances, victims of society. People play the victim card because it absolves them of responsibility. It's not my fault. How many people have you seen in a diabolical, terrible situation going, it's not my fault. Someone did this to me. We see it all the time. If you get on Facebook, the fount of all modern wisdom, of course, for two minutes and just read comments that are put down, you will see people playing the victim card again and again and again. Look at what's happened to me again. You know, I never get a break. My life is lousy. Have you seen that on Facebook? I really like the people who, who try and get a response from you of compassion. So they put out their 
feeling discouraged, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> you know, most people say, oh, are, are you okay? Why are you feeling discouraged? I kind of go, oh, that's really manipulative. I'm not going to bother, you know. But a lot of people are moved to, to sort of reply to that because people are fish, they're playing the victim card all the time. There's no mention of their bad decisions. There's no mention of their bad attitudes. The continued failure to repent and to change and all that sort of stuff. It's no, it's like, woe is me. I am, you know, life is so hard towards me. And some of these folks, I feel like saying, have a look at the decisions you've made. There's the explanation as to why life is so hard for you. You did this to yourself. Don't blame everybody else. And until we, we man up as a nation and as a people and say, I'm at fault, I repent, I change, you're not going to see that situation change at all. I found a little poem, I like this, and uh, I like it because my wife is a psychotherapist and um, this was right up her alley. So listen to this, it's a, it's a little poem I found. I went to my psycho uh, psychiatrist to be psychoanalyzed to find out why I killed the cat and blackened my husband's eyes. He laid me on a downy couch to see what he could find. So this is what he dredged up from my subconscious mind. When I was one, my mummy hid my dolly in a trunk. And so it follows naturally that I am always drunk. When I was two, I saw my father kiss the maid one day. And that's, that is why I suffer now from kleptomania. At three, I had the feeling of ambivalence towards my brothers. And so it follows naturally that I poisoned all my lovers. But I am happy now. I've learned the lesson that this has taught, that everything I do that's wrong is someone else's fault. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Now, I'm not saying that there's not... You know, I'm married to a psychotherapist. I'm not saying that things in your past don't affect you. I'm not saying that, that uh, you know, I'm not sort of having a shot at that. But what I am saying is when you decide not to be a victim and you step up and take responsibilities for your actions, that's when your life changes. So stop comparing yourself to and then blaming everybody else. Step up, take responsibility for what you say and do. Our world is full of people comparing themselves and telling themselves that they are the victim. But listen, listen to me now. Victim mentality is not okay. It's one, it's one of the sins that results from comparing ourselves with other people. And it's self-victimization. So, they're the sort of the way it comes about. Let me talk about how we can counteract this common and destructive character flaw of comparing and how God can make, turn our weaknesses into strength. I want to give you a cure for the disease of comparison. Comparison is the root from which envy, coveting, and seeing yourself as a victim grow. So let's look at how God can transform our life and make this weakness into a strength. Here are three ways, as I finish up, three ways that you can turn weakness of comparing yourself with others, envy and discontent, and turn it into a strength in your life. Number one is have a contented spirit. You know, we live in a world that is steeped in marketing. If you go anywhere, there's signs blaring at you, there's television screaming at you. It's all marketing. Now, if you talk to a marketer, there's a number of steps that a marketer goes through in trying to get you to buy their product. The first step is to make you discontent with what you have now. It is. I've been to marketing conferences and that's what they say. Step number one, make people discontent with what they have now. I remember being in a slum 30 years ago in Mumbai. Has anyone here been to Mumbai? No? Okay. A, a charming, if slightly smelly city. Um, I was standing in a slum. It was actually the slum that Slumdog Millionaire was filmed in. And everywhere you looked was slum. But I noticed right at the edge of the slum, well, first of all, I noticed that everyone was happy. You know, you meet people in, and they were glad to see you. They were smiling. They were joyous. They were just really nice people in a tough situation. But I noticed that the edge of the slum was, was like a building site. And so they plugged a cord into this power point on the building site and it looped down and every house, the cord went to every house right through the slum. I don't know who's paying the bill for this, but that's how it worked, right? And every house had by hook or by crook, these people who have nothing got a television. A little tiny, usually black and white TV at the time. And I noticed this and I commented that every bit of shanty and tin in that house with these happy people living in a slum had a television. And the, the friend who was with me said, 
He said, in one year, everybody in this slum will be completely miserable. Why? Because they turn on the television and they see people living better than them. Comparison. And it, it, that actually uh, proved to be true. You know, people, people got more and more miserable the more they saw what everyone else said. You ever seen that TV show, The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous? Did it ever bless you? I just got so mad. And, and you know, I, I, it's, it's just the, 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 the pressure to compare is right there. Comparison breeds discontent. Philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer said this, Wealth is like seawater. The more you drink, the thirstier you become. Isn't that interesting? See, comparisons are the basis of, of being discontented with your life. Uh, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, Paul writes this, But godliness with contentment is great, great gain. For we do not bring anything into the world, we can take nothing out of the world. If we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Paul's perspective was, you brought nothing into the world, you're going to take nothing out. We should be content with what the Lord gives us. And as we heard from Dr. Colin a, a couple of weeks ago, we're all going to die and shrouds don't have pockets. You can't take it with you. I heard of two kids sitting on a hill in a town one day, looking down, there was a funeral procession and one said to the other, whose funeral is this? And the other one said, that's the local millionaire. It's his funeral. Oh, said the first little boy. So how much money did he leave behind? And the other one answered, all of it. Step back, have a look at the wonderful blessings we have in our nation. Have a look at your life. In this country, even the poorest people are blessed compared to other nations around the world. So we should be thankful, should we not? We should be content in many things. Yet we are probably the most discontented generation in history. Why? Because we have the internet and we can compare ourselves with everybody all over the place and fuel our discontent. See, God blesses us. We should count His blessings upon our life, not someone, His blessings on someone else's life. Look at what you have. Look at the people who love you. Comparisons rob us of our contentment. It really does. I thought I was a pretty good guitarist. You notice the past tense there. You know, I play a reasonable guitar. I, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm pretty cool. I've done a lot of recording and so I'm pretty cool. Then I went to see the Eagles in concert last week. And Joe Walsh and Stu, Stu Smith amazed me. And I thought, I am a useless guitarist. I might as well never pick that up again. Comparisons. I'm very discontent with my guitaring now. So, remember, being content... Godliness with content is great gain. And so the first way that we can combat comparisons and envy is to just be content with what God has given us. But there is a difference between being content and settling for less. So you need to be content with what God's given you and trust Him. But it means you can still have the ambition to be someone greater for the Lord. Okay, I'm not saying be content and therefore don't try. I'm saying be content and don't compare all the time. The second thing that will combat comparisons, envy and coveting, is having a generous spirit. Now, even in our darkest financial times, Fiona and I always determined to be generous. Do you have a generous spirit? I'm not talking about what you give to church. I'm just talking about everything, your whole life. Are you generous? You know, um, if, if you ever go out to dinner with Fiona and I, which hopefully you will do at some point, you will find me the first guy to go and pay. Not because I like losing money, but because I just want to be generous. And I know the more that I am generous, the more just the Lord just blesses me. I will often lend stuff out. I'll lend my car out. I'll lend, you know, other stuff that we have out. Because I don't want to hold on to something physical, which is just something physical. I'd rather have a generous spirit than that physical object. I don't want to grasp at things. Often we refuse to be generous because we're frightened of loss. I remember this was tested one time. We had a young lady visiting our church from uh, the US and she asked to borrow my car. And I said, no problem. Threw her the keys, off you go. Didn't dawn on me we all drive on the opposite side of the road. But anyway, that's another story. Um, and she managed to in a, a really big car park back into another car with my car 
And I kind of went, okay, this is a good test to see if I'm really generous. So I had to pay the insurance, you know, um, what do they call it, deductible, excess. Um, I had to pay all that sort of stuff and smile sweetly and love that young lady. So, you know, it really is true. Having a generous spirit can counteract all of the comparison stuff. Luke chapter 6 verse 38 is a great verse. It says this, Give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. Listen to this. For with the measure you used, it will be measured to you. Have a listen to that. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. If you measure out what you give with a teaspoon, God will shovel stuff back with a teaspoon. If you measure it out with a dump truck, hang on. It's going to come back at you with multiples of dump truck. You know, I think it's an incredible thing to have a generous spirit. So to counteract envy and coveting, which is caused by comparisons. If you don't value stuff to the point where you can freely share it, it has no hold over you. And comparisons lose their power to distort your point of view because it doesn't matter. The third thing is, and I'll finish with this, is a gratitude attitude. Now, we don't have this a lot in our society, but comparing yourself to others, noting what you lack and what you have more of or whatever it is, is never productive. Yet if we're honest, we all struggle with it. Even if outwardly we seem well to do, we and seem outwardly content, most of us struggle inwardly with this. There is always someone richer, someone better off, someone more successful than you to be envious of. And there is always someone less successful than you to, for you to feel superior about. Both are the results of comparison. Both of them are wrong. And can I say it? Both of them are sin. Before you rush out and find a better job, a better house, a better car, a better church, or a better husband or wife, have a gratitude attitude about what you have. So it all comes down to the attitude. Now, when flying a plane, the angle of the plane to the horizon is called the attitude. It's measured with something called an attitude indicator or an artificial horizon. The height above the ground is called the altitude. It's measured by something called an altimeter. And there's a terrific saying which applies to planes and it applies to life. Your attitude determines your altitude. If your nose down, you can't go up. You don't go up. You go where? Down. If your nose is up, if your attitude is in the upward direction, suddenly you move to new heights. And it's true about planes. It's true about life. The angle of your plane determines the altitude you can reach. So our attitude needs to be one that points up, not one that points down. So stop comparing, looking down and comparing yourself with other people and instead take your eyes off other people and put your eyes on Jesus. Uh, Psalm 121 says this, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? I often think of that. I look up. I look to the hills. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. See, let me ask you, are you content or are you comparing? I want you to have a look at your life. Are you content or are you comparing? Think about one major lack that you have that you've noticed in comparison to others. Because in a moment we want to give that to the Lord. But first, I want to ask you to have a look at your life. I don't know your history. I don't know where you've come from. But I know in this room there will be people who have struggled because they have, not themselves, others have compared them to someone else. I think in particularly of people who, um, and some of you will be here, you've been compared, compared to your siblings, your brothers and sisters, and you've been like the loser of that comparison. And parents will th say things like, why aren't you like so-and-so? He's really well behaved and you're not. He's really successful and you're not. There's many of us have had to face this. Maybe, you know, sometimes it happens from your kids. If you're going through a divorce or a separation or have been, very often the kids will say, you know, I don't like you, I like the other one. You know, I don't like you, mum, I'd rather be with dad because he, I have fun with him and you're always the mean one. That sort of thing. Those comparisons, they're set against us, but they can destroy us if they get in our head and run around in our head. So would you bow your heads, please? I'm going to ask you, if you are the victim of that sort of comparison, I just want to focus in on you right now. 
And I want you to be honest with yourself. If you have felt compared to your siblings or compared to your ex or something like that, I'm just going to ask you to stand up where you are. Now, I know it's a step to stand up. I know it's hard. But I really believe we need to deal with this and get this comparison out of the way. If that's you, just take a few moments. Just stand up where you are. I know this is you. There are people in this room who are struggling with this. Don't be ashamed. It's not even your fault, but someone else has compared you and you've struggled with it. Just take a few seconds. Look at your life. If that's you, if you've been compared adversely to, to someone else, it might even be a friend, might be a co-worker, might be siblings. If that's you, I'm just going to ask you to stand up where you are. Just very quickly. We're not going to call you forward on this one. Just stand up where you are because I know God's doing business in the house today. The Lord has a message to those of you who are struggling with this. You need to know. You need to know. Each and every one of you needs to know that you are not an accident. You are not a freak. You are not a second class citizen. The Lord would say to you today, those of you who, who are feeling this right now, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, the Lord says to you. That you are created in the image of God. And the Lord says this to you, as He said to Jeremiah in chapter 1 verse 5, God has set you apart. From before you were born, God set you apart. Before you were born, you have a destiny. And, and comparisons cannot kill this unless you let them. So if you're standing, I want you to say this with me. Say, Lord, I repent of, of the effect this has had on my life. Just say it with me. I repent of the effect this has had on my life. And I ask you, Lord, to give me a clear understanding that I am fearfully and wonderfully made, a child of the living God, and that you have greatness as a destiny for me. Would you all stand?